Thank you very much. It's good to be back in Berkeley. So <laughs> it's good to see you all. Thank you for coming. Thank you, the organizers, uh, for inviting me to speak. My talk is um, entitled, or two talks rather, are entitled uh, Gauge Theory and uh, Langlands Program. So the goal is eventually to talk about some recent advances connecting the two subjects. But I want to start by maybe giving a slight kind of a, a, brief, a brief survey, a brief overview of, um, of what the Langlands program is about and how do we go from um, some problems in number theory, some classical, so to speak, classical subjects to some more modern stuff like gauge theory. And so for me, when I was learning this subject, uh, what was very helpful is a certain picture which, was, which I learned by reading a, a famous letter from Andre Wey to his sister, Simone Wey, which actually, for those of you who don't know, he wrote it in 1940 when he was in jail, imprisoned for refusing to serve in the army. And I always thought that maybe you know, we should use the same method to extract kind of nice uh, big picture surveys from other mathematicians. We don't need a war for that. We can just put them in jail and say, <laughs> just do it, you know. So, um, but he talked about um, these three uh, threads, three columns, so to speak, in, in mathematics, which interested him the most. And so, and he was, his proposal was that the three threads are very similar and there are analogies between them and that we have to exploit those analogies to, to see more clearly what's really, going, what's really going on. So what are these three threads? The first one has to do with number theory. And uh, when I say number theory, I mean the theory of numbers, so you have uh, the whole numbers, integers, and you have rational numbers, which are the fractions. And then we are considering various equations with coefficients in rational numbers. For example, uh, x squared plus 1 equals 0. And uh, we, we see that the equation does not have solutions in, this in the field of rational numbers. So we join the solutions and we get new fields, which are called number fields, such as the field in which you adjoin a solution of this equation, which we call i, and it's, and it's negative. So, and then we study things like automorphisms of such fields, so groups of symmetries of such fields, and these are called Galois groups. I say, for example, it could be a Galois group of this field over the field of rational numbers. It has two elements, the identity, and the one exchanging the two solutions, i and negative i, but then we can also adjoin all possible solutions of all equations, uh, polynomial equations in one variable. So we get what's called algebraic closure. And so we can consider a, 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 what's called the absolute Galois group of the field of rational numbers, all symmetries of this algebraic closure. And we may study representations of this group and things like that. So that's one. That's the colon, so to speak, on the left. On the right, in Andre Weiss, uh, a dream, so to speak, was um, something totally different, or something that looks totally different, which is um, the study of geometry of Riemann surfaces. Riemann surfaces. And so, the initially, uh, so you have some, something like this. Uh, this is a Riemann surface. Or you have, can have a, a torus or a sphere, or something like this. And uh, at first, it looks like the two subjects have nothing to do with each other, but they are connected. This was the realization. And they are connected because there is something in between. And what is this something? Well, first of all, we can realize that Riemann surfaces can also be viewed as algebraic curves. Curves. So we can, uh, over, over the field of complex numbers, so we can write an algebraic equation on two variables, I will look at such equations in a bit and look for complex solutions. And then it turns out that, in, uh, for example, you can represent the shape like this as the set of solutions of such an equation. 
So that's already interesting because algebraic curves over C, so you look at equations with coefficients or solutions in complex numbers, but then you can do the same for other fields. And so this way you arrive at this intermediate uh, uh, subject, which is the study of algebraic curves over finite fields. Finite fields, maybe I just write FQ. So if Q is a finite field of Q elements where Q is a power of a prime number. So it's clear that there is an analogy between these two because here you have a curve over C, over complex numbers. Here you have a curve over a finite field. But also there is an analogy here because, for instance, um, what you can do is you can look at the field of functions on such a curve. Let's call it X, X over FQ. And so say if x is p1, just a projective line over fq, then this field is a field of fractions um, of two polynomials in one variable such that they have no common factors and the one uh, in the denominator is non-zero. Just like the field of rational numbers is, consists of fractions of two integers. So a polynomial is like an integer, uh, uh, a fraction like this is like a rational number. So this field is like the field of rational numbers. And you can look at the Galois group then also of f bar over f and, and so on. So there's an analogy here. Okay, so that's what he's describing to his sister. And of course, this was, this was known before. People knew that. But maybe what happened, I think, is that Andrei Wey allowed himself to become fully aware of this. He just decided to believe in this completely. But this is the truth. And let us take this truth and let's see how far we can go with it. This was his, uh, this, and this was a big step, I think. So it's really a big step. It doesn't matter that this was already known. He, he really believed it more than anyone else, I think, before him. And voila, um, one of the things that came out of this realization, of this awakening of sorts, was the gay conjectures which I think really was one of the most important developments in mathematics in the second half of the 20th century. And it's clear how, because on the one hand, you have here, I don't know, Galois groups, you have also zeta function, Riemann zeta function, and you have L functions. So on this side, this side is telling you that you should look for these objects here, and they're not so difficult to define, just by this analogy. But this side, is communicating to you something else, that this is geometry. And when you have geometry, you have cohomology. You, have, you can linearize your varieties, things like that. You, can, you get functors to vector spaces. So you have some vector spaces you can assign to these objects. Therefore, you should be able to do it here. And that's what we now call the et al. cohomology. And then he put these two together and said, OK, so you can express values of a function in terms of, or the L function itself, in terms of the tal cohomology on various structures on the tal cohomology. So this was his a big progress, okay? Now, I would like to use this analogy and this dictionary of sorts to talk about the Langlands program. It's very useful because the originally the Langlands program was formulated by Langlands in the late 60s, and in fact, interestingly enough, Langlands uh, first proposed his ideas in a letter to no one else but Andrei Wey. And uh, it actually, uh, it's funny because this letter is available in the Institute of, uh, for Advanced Study in the archive, and you can see it online. And um, I don't know, I'm just, I'm just very tempted now to read the cover, the cover letter. It's actually. Maybe I should mention that, uh, should mention that uh, some of the stuff I'm talking about is, is in my book. Uh, something, would be, so, something would be amiss if I did not mention it, right? I mean, so, but I, I had to open it because I don't remember by heart. So. so he said, Professor Wei, in response to your invitation to come and talk, I wrote the enclosed letter. After I wrote it, I realized there was hardly a statement in it of which I was certain. If you are willing to read it as pure speculation, I would appreciate that. If not, I'm sure you have a waste basket handy. So, kind of uh, remarkable for its understatement, but uh, what followed was really 
this beautiful ideas which we now, which gave birth to what we now call the Langlands program. And so what was, what was the idea? The idea was to connect, so the Langlands program It's 1967, that letter to Andre Vey. He wanted to connect things starting here, really in this column. Um, on the one side, he wanted to understand representations of the Galois group, representations of this, of the Galois groups. For example, of the, uh, of the algebraic closure of Q. And on the other side, automorphic representation, there are different, there are many, there are many ideas actually. So there are many ways to look at the Langlands program. But this is one way to look, and I think it's a good entry point to say that it's about connecting objects of two different nature. One is representations of the Galois group, and the other one is automorphic representations. So let's say n-dimensional automorphic representations of group GLN over the Adels. Now, it is not important right now what are these automorphic representations, but this object should be clear because the Adels were defined in, in already in, in the first lecture, and this is a group GLN over the Adels, so n by n matrices with invertible uh, with coefficients in this, with entries from this ring of Adels. Okay. And so the idea was that these two are, should be connected. So this was here. And now the point is that you can then transform, transform it to this side. And this, of course, he already knew. Langlands already knew because these are so close to each other that once you can say something, something here, it more or less automatically you can transform, translate. But the next step was already more difficult. And this took years. This took years, and this became clear, became, or the contours became, started to become clear in the 80s due to the, some really groundbreaking work by uh, people like uh, Dreamfeld and Lamont and then Bellinson and others. And so, and then, what happened more recently in the last, I would say, 10 years, is the fact, the realization that actually to these three columns, we should add one more. which has to do with quantum physics. And this is where things like S-duality and mirror symmetry, mirror symmetry reside. Mirror symmetry. Okay. And so I would like to talk about this. But first I would like to, since there hasn't been a discussion really of, what, of the origins, so maybe I want to say a little bit in, even if everyone here already knows, maybe people who are watching this in the video might, might find this useful, I don't know. But I want to say a few things. So what kind of connections, what is this connection? Why is it interesting? Why, why we care about this? And so I want to discuss a, a, simple, a really simple uh, and very nice, simple but representative example. And this example is a connection between between uh, elliptic curves over the rational numbers and modular forms. forms. So elliptic curves are the avatars in this case of um, this more general things, the representations of the Galois group. So in this case, this, this can be uh, to such an elliptic curve, we can assign a two dimensional. So n is equal to two, this n, or oh, small n n is equal to two, two-dimensional representation of the Galois group. And it's clear how, well, clear, clear due to Andre Weiss efforts, and others as well, who define the type homology, because an elliptic curve um, will have a type homology, and this type homology will be, first type homology will be two-dimensional, just like the usual homology, the Ram homology of an elliptic curve over C. And that will give rise to a two-dimensional representation of this, Galois, of this Galois group. And on the other hand, modular forms are connected to automorphic representations. So the avatars of automorphic representations 
in presentations of GL2 over the Adels. So these forms, they live on the upper half plane. So it's just a complex plane of numbers tau with imaginary part greater than zero. And they encode automorphic representations of GL2, some automorphic representations of GL2. So we're really describing this connection, but we're describing it in more concrete language using these avatars. And I want to give an example of what this connection is. And this will be a kind of an example of what this is all about and why this is interesting. Okay, let me leave this here for now. Although, we'll come to this later. Okay. So, something, I want to give something very, very concrete. Okay. So, look at this equation. Plus y equals... This is an example, by the way, also I discuss in my book, uh, Love and Math. And I actually, I learned it from Richard Taylor, and I, I think it's really beautiful. Um, also, just look at this equation, okay? So, you have integer coefficients, so you can look at this equation, modulo primes. So, first of all, this equation is an equation which defines an, uh, an elliptic curve over the, over the integers, over the rational numbers over the integers. And now we can look at, for solutions, modulo primes. So, P is a prime. It's a prime number. So, it's like 2, 3... 5, 7, 9, 11, and so on. Okay, some people are awake. That's good. Now, <laughs> now, you look for solutions. So, for example, if you, you can find that if P is 5, you can find four solutions. So, it's an exercise for those who are bored. You can, you can find the, those the solutions. And now you record them. You record the solutions, but what you do, actually, let's do, let's denote by AP, the number p plus 1 minus the number of solutions, so, uh, solutions for a given prime p. So, for example, uh, okay, I, if I wrote this way, maybe p minus, to really get an elliptic curve, we have to also add a point at infinity. Since I said number of solutions, then we will, I'm not counting the infinite solutions, so it would be p minus the, the, the numbers of, number of solutions. Okay, and so just solutions of this equation, finite solutions. Okay, and so we, we can make a list, you know, so for each number, you got some number, some number, some number for each p. And they look like totally random. They're kind of, they're close to, um, they're kind of uh, close to zero, but they are oscillating, sometimes positive, sometimes negative, and it looks like completely random. That's the object on the left side, an elliptic curve. And you have a bunch of numbers. On the other hand, you consider the following expression. You just write q times 1 minus q squared times 1 minus q to the 11 squared times 1 minus q squared squared times 1 minus q to the 22 squared. And I think now you can continue. Right? So just 1 minus q to any 1 minus q to any int, a positive integer squared and 1 minus q to the 11 times positive integer squared, right? You have this expression, and then you can just open the brackets, and you're going to end up with a series, with a, with a Taylor series, formal Taylor series like this, so n goes from 1 to infinity. It starts with q, so there is no constant term. It starts with n equal 1, and b1 is, act, is actually equal to 1. And then the statement is that AP is equal to BP for all P, all prime numbers. Okay? And I think this is absolutely astounding because what do they, could these two things possibly have to do with each other? Here you have a problem of seemingly infinite complexity. You have an equation and you have to solve this equation for each of the infinitely many primes and you get some numbers. And now it turns out that the solution is given by one line. All of these numbers are uh, 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 encoded in here. So that is an example of the, of the Langlands, of Langlands correspondence. That it, tell, it allows you to translate some question which looks like infinitely complicated to a question which looks manageable or tractable. Okay? So this is an example. And 
It turns out that the same is true for other elliptic curves. So here is an elliptic curve defined by this very specific equation for which the corresponding uh, modular form. Ah, so there is more because this is not just some formula around power series, but if you write Q as so Taylor power series as e to the 2 pi i tau, tau being um, a point in the upper half plane, then this will actually be an analytic function on the upper half plane. So if imaginary part of tau is greater than zero, then q bar, q bar is less than one, the series will converge, and it has special properties under the action of the group SL to Z, which sends tau to a tau plus b, c tau plus d, more precisely under a certain subgroup of this, gr of this group of all such um, a, b, c, d um, quadruples or matrices. Okay, so, and it, the same is true for other, but the modular form in general will not be so nicely written. It's difficult to write, more difficult to write. And this is known as a Tanyama, a Shimura Tanyama way conjecture, which has been proved, of course, by, by Wiles and Taylor in the stable case, and then by other, others completed. So it is now a theorem. And this is a special case of the Langlands correspondence. So this is what this is about. So this, we're trying to, First of all, to see what kind of results, what kind of connections there are between these two worlds. These are really two different worlds, and we are connecting with these two worlds, right? And we're trying to understand why. Why these two worlds are connected. So, this is here. But now we move it here also. And to do that, we simply replace Maybe I should write Shimura Tanyama way. Maybe I should give one more reference because um, in, in my, yes, in my book I, I talk about this, but in this specific example, and I talk a little bit about the general story, but it's a popular book, so I can't really go into details. But the details of this are in, uh, in a survey article I wrote, which is called The Langlands Program and Conformal Field, Lectures on the Langlands Program and Conformal Field Theory. And conformal field theory, and this is on the archive, on HEPTH, actually, in um, 2005, where you can uh, describe in detail this uh, Shimura Tanyama way conjecture. You know, uh, not necessarily just for this curve, but for, for more general ones. Of course, there are many other sources. And also, I talk about how to translate, how to move to the middle column. Middle column. So we go to the middle column. So in the middle column, instead of the field of rational numbers, we consider what's called function field. Function field. And the function field could be, for example, functions on a, on a projective line over a finite field. This would be, um, as I said already, ratios of uh, relatively prime polynomials. Uh, in one variable over this field, FQ, finite field. Or in general, it could be, it will be F of X, meromorphic functions, oh, I'm already saying, I'm already jumping ahead. So it would be meromorphic functions in this column, but now it's rational functions on this curve. And what is X? X is a smooth projective. Um, it's called also it's geometric, one more property is geometrically connected, which means that it remains connected when we pass to the algebraic closure of FQ. Curve over finite field. So we have this field, and we have the Galois group. We have the Galois group of this field, and we have, um, we have a certain subgroup, which is called the Way group, it's not, it's maybe not necessary to explain right now what this is. But the message should be the, is the same, that representations of this group should be related to automorphic representations of GLN. So this double, so what is representation? This will be a map to GLN. I'm not specifying over which field, I'm kind of uh, cutting some, cor some corners. Uh, this is explained in more detail, for example, in this survey, but many other places. And on the other hand, 
automorphic representations, automorphic representations of GLN over the adels of this field. What are the adels of this field? So we already learned that adels of the field of rational numbers is, is a product of uh, QP, where P is a prime. Restricted product uh, times the real numbers. And if you have a function field, also very nice, it is the pro restricted product over all closed points. Of closed, all closed points of the curve, where fx is isomorphic to Laurent power series over um, in one variable, sort of co local, co so to speak, local coordinate at this point. Although the uh, the constant may be a little bigger than the original field because it's not algebraically closed, so it's a residue field, a residue field of this point of x. So, so this two should be connected. Again, this follows, this follows by sort of applying uh, Langland's idea plus the idea that these two things are analogous. But it turns out that the middle column is simpler. So whereas in the left column, we still don't have the full proof of the Langland's correspondence. In the middle column, this is actually a theorem. Theorem, if you define things in the right way, due to uh, Dreamfield. Maybe let me write this in here. Dreamfield for n equal two, and Laurent Lafourc. Lafourc for n greater than two. This is a theorem. So these things are connected. And then we make an, a next step, which is, and which already Langlands made in his uh, original uh, letter to Andre Vey and his uh, subsequent writings. We replace this group, GLN, by a more, reduct more general reductive al al algebraic group. So we have now G also. Algebraic group which in general you're going to have a group over F, over this field F. But let's say, if we just simplify and say just over the scalars, just over FQ. And so, the, so then the question is, what if, what if we do this? What will happen here? So here's GLN, here's GLN. But here's the, the crucial difference happens, which is that it will not go into G, but it will go what's called the Langlands draw group. So that's, the, that's how it makes an appearance. Langlands dual group. And this is something which immediately uh, communicates to you that this is something really not trivial and something complicated and mysterious. Because you start with a group G. If it's GLN, the dual group is GLN, so it gives us a, a false sense of, sense of security. But if your group is, for example, odd orthogonal group, SO2N plus 1, then the dual group is a symplectic group, SP2N. And the two are a priori not connected at all. And yet, through this correspondence, they are connected. They appear on both sides. So this is completely crazy. And we have to realize that. It is. So that's why we're doing this. As you know, somebody said, uh, Jacques Cousteau, I don't know. He said, yeah, I, do know, I, know, I do know that's completely crazy. That's why I'm doing this, you know? So, so, or maybe he says, I know it's impossible. That's why I'm doing this. But I think it's the same. So, OK. And then if you take the more general group, then we are still, things become much more complicated. And in fact, for the fundamental lemma and things like that are just the first steps in understanding how things become more complicated when you go from GLN to general groups. It's very interesting. Already, already incredibly sophisticated um, chunk of mathematics just for that, just to even set up things for the general group and, and it's Langlands dual. For GLN, things are, more, are, are simpler. Okay, so we can, so, and of course, we, we need to understand that. We need to understand that. But, and this one, one of the directions that we have to move in but another way is, another direction is to say, okay, 
But what is it going to look like here? Let's travel. Let's continue traveling between worlds. Let's move on to this one and see what happens here. Maybe this will give us some clues about the original question and the middle colon. Okay? So that's where we are. We are coming now to the algebraic curves over C. And this is what Adi Marinkin talked about in his, in his talk just before me. So what do we need to know here to, um, to, connect, to connect the different realities, the different worlds? We need to know, uh, you see, what, where is the correspondence? It's here. So you have Galois group on this side. Then you have automorphic representations on this side. So we need to find analogs of that. And the, the analog of the Galois group that we will choose is the fundamental group of our curve. So now x, maybe x, will be, again, a smooth projective curve as before, but now over the complex numbers. So we are squarely in this column, in this world now. What is the analog of the Galois group? And so the idea is that geometrically, we now need to think geometrically because we are in a geometric realm, and so we need to take advantage of it. We need to work geometrically. So geometrically, the analog of the Galois group, and, and Dima already mentioned that in his talk. So I could say f is c of x. The analog of this is the fundamental group of this curve with respect to some re reference point. When you define, strictly speaking, when you define the fundamental group of an object, of a, of a variety or manifold, so you have to pick a reference point because, for example, in topology, we do it by means of paths and we have to say where the path begins and ends. Of course, all these groups are isomorphic to each other, but to define this group, we have to fix it. So, so let's just keep it here, even though it's not going to be so important because when I make these brackets, in fact, I'm talking about equivalence classes of objects. So, the equivalence classes of those isomorphic groups will be the same, so it's not so, it's not such a big deal. Fundamental group. Now, more precisely, it is the analog of the unramified part of the Galois group. So it's kind of, a, we are actually already restricting ourselves to something, but this is a good uh, first step to look at the unramified case. So it becomes the fundamental group. And therefore, on the left-hand side, we're going to have homomorphisms to LG which we then describe is there actually an equivalence of categories, but certainly an isomorphism of sets. These are sets. We are talking about sets on both sides. I'll come to this in a minute. Flat LG bundles on X. So more concretely, you can think of this as a, just a C infinity bundle Maybe I put infinity here. And the connection. And the connection on it. Now, but if you have a connection on this, it's a Riemann surface, it's zero one part, the anti-holomorphic part. Since you have a complex structure, you can break it into two parts. One zero and zero one. So the zero one part will give you a holomorphic structure on this bundle. And then the one zero part will remain as a holomorphic connection. So instead of thinking in terms of a C infinity bundle and a, fl a flat connection, you can think also in terms of just a holomorphic bundle and a holomorphic connection. So it's a very concrete way to think about flat LG bundles. That's, what, that's the objects on the left-hand side. And the objects on the right-hand side, so this is where we end up with what uh, Dima talked about, the D modules on bungee. So he talked about bungee LN. He talked about bungee LN as being a certain object in algebraic geometry which describes GLN bundles. And now, for example, if N is one, this is a Picard variety, more or less, almost Picard variety if we don't care if we make some small adjustments so that we don't care about automorphisms of line bundles. But the same can be done for general G. And this gives us this object, which is called the moduli stack of G bundles 
principal G bundle. When I say G bundle, it always means principal G bundle. Bundles on X. Maybe I should emphasize, these are holomorphic. If you want to think of X as a compact Riemann surface, these are holomorphic G bundles. I prefer to think of it as an algebraic curve over C. So these are algebraic bundles. The two are the same because the curve is compact. These two notions are the same, according to Sears Gaga, if you will. OK? And we can see the uh, moduli stack. So it's an object whose points are precisely equivalence classes of such bundles. But it has finer structure because it also carries information about automorphisms of each of those bundles. That's why it's called a stack. It is, in fact, an algebraic stack. OK. So why D modules? Why D modules? D modules being a notion of just a sheaf of a modules over the sheaf of differential operators on this gadget. So this is a long story, why D modules? And this is what took so long, somehow, after people already understood this part, it took so long to translate and took the genius of people like Greenfield, Lamont, and so on, and Lean, and so on. And and actually, Grothendieck. So the initial, I guess, uh, understanding came from Grothendieck because Grothendieck said that automorphic representations, okay, so these are functions. And so the question was what to find, uh, the representations are spent by functions. For instance, a modular function, we just looked at it, a very concrete thing, it's a function. So what we are doing really is trying to find a geometric avatar, geometric incarnation for a function. And, the, and Grothendieck explained what this should be, this should be shifts of particular kind, the constructible sheaves of perverse sheaves, or whatever you want to call them. And that's a very nice story, which I'm not going to get into, but this is a message from functions to sheaves. And these sheaves, in this particular context, one of the possible ways to think about them is in the language of D-modules. That's why D-modules appear here, and they take place of things like modular forms, like automorphic functions. Like, like functions which appear in, in more general automorphic representations. But the question remains why it should be on Bungie? Why it should be on Bungie and not somewhere else? And the reason for that, which by the way also goes back to Andre Bay, is the realization that this Bungie can be actually expressed as, as a double quotient. This is the Adels. These are the so-called integer Adels. So instead of Laurent series, you take Taylor series. And this is F. When automorphic representations are, in fact, defined as functions on this quotient. And sometimes these functions are invariant under the subgroup, so it gives rise to functions on the double quotient, precisely in the unramified situation. But just to see where we are, I'm wondering how many people already know this. Can you raise your hands if you already know this? Okay, okay, very good. Well, congratulations, I have news for you. This is actually not true in, in general. No, I'm joking. It's not true in general if you consider a, a general group uh, scheme over, over X. But I'm considering constant group schemes, so to speak, so groups over, over just the scalar field, finite field. Then it is true, so this is fine. Actually, now I'm even over complex numbers, then yes, everything's fine. But this actually, there is an interesting story about this, which is usually not told for, for general groups, group schemes, for general groups over the field of functions rather than over the constant field. So it's an interesting question already here to have whether we have such an isomorphism. And the proofs that are not so simple, in fact, if you think about it. But anyway, so in our situation, it is true. And that's why Bungie makes an appearance. It's not by choice, it's not because of course, D. Marinkin started from a different uh, point. His departure point was different. He said, okay, well, Bungie is an interesting object in algebraic geometry. What do, does the category of D modules on it look like? What, what, are, are there any special objects and so on? But if your starting point is a Langlands program, which is here, that you want to understand connections between Galois representations and automorphic functions, this is how you arrive at Bungie. You're forced to consider Bungie because it is the object which represents this double quotient. More precisely, this double quotient is just a set of equivalence classes or isomorphism classes of G bundles. And this is an algebra geometric object. So maybe easier to write like this, that this is a set of points, so to speak, of this object. Or if you think about the quotient in the sense of algebraic geometry, then it will also be true uh, as a, as an isomorphism of algebraic stacks. 
once again, automorphic forms, automorphic representations in the classical story are defined as functions on this quotient, but we are considering the unramified case, which means that we, each such reducible representation will have a function invariant under this subgroup, and so we, um, it will give rise to a function on this double quotient. This double quotient is a set of points of a moduli stack of G bundles, and so this gives us an idea following growth and dict that instead of functions on this double quotient, we should consider sheaves on Bungie. That's what we do. So, okay, so this is nice. And this was the understanding in the subject, more or less, uh, in the late uh, 80s, early 90s, due to, uh, so decisive step was really Bellinson and Drinfeld, they really put it in a very nice form in early 90s. But it looks, uh, it looks a little bit disconcerting because the objects on two sides are very different, right? These are objects of a category. Of a category. Of D, namely, the category of D modules. But these are points. This is a set. So I already said that this is a set and this is a set. So some special D modules, which are objects of this category, should be in one, one <coughs> correspondence with equivalence classes of representations of the Galois group, of the fundamental group. This is strange because there is no category here, a priori. Well, there is a category of such, but it's not very, it's not very interesting. Or, put or rather, it is interesting if we, it will become interesting if we would try to involve other groups. For instance, if you have a representation n-dimensional and and k-dimensional, you can take the direct sum. You get a representation which is n plus k-dimensional. But see, but that would take us out of this correspondence because it will change the group. So of course, that immediately raises questions as to whether such operations, like taking direct sum of two representations, at least in the case when this is GLN, should have something, some analogs on this side. But this is the next step. This is the next level question. The first question is just to understand this for a fixed group. And we see that it's very strange because this is a set of points and these are mm, some objects of a category. So could it be that there is a category behind this as well? And this is what was understood uh, later. This also goes back to Bellinson and Drinfeld. And now Dima is explaining to us in his lectures uh, the right uh, framework for a categorical statement of the language correspondence, of the geometric language correspondence, and which uh, is now being developed by, by him and uh, Dennis Geisgeri and Rimfeld, so they already have, so he will tell us what the latest is, but as far as I know, it, now there is a precise conjecture, which perhaps even has been proved in some cases and so on. So we'll, I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing this. So for now, I just want to give an outline, the way I understand it, of what this categorical statement will look like, which will be kind of more rounded and more symmetrical on both sides, unlike this provisional statement or conjecture. Which, by the way, this has been proved. This has been proved in some cases, or constructed, really, because it's very hard to say, to make this into conjecture, because we're not saying which D modules precisely. So maybe... There is an extra statement, the sort of Hecke eigen sheaves, which are D modules having special properties. So the, in this provisional formulation, it's really a question of constructing such a Hecke eigen sheaf given such a homomorphism, or if you will, I actually I prefer to think as a, a holomorphic bundle with a holomorphic connection. And it has been done. For GLN, for example, it's been done. For GL2, already Drinfeld did this. For GLN, uh, uh, Lamont made some important contributions, and then uh, Gates, Gary Villain, and myself did this. And Balancing and Drinfeld also did for a large class of flat bundles if the group is semi-simple, so-called opers. But it's still a little unsatisfactory. So what would be more satisfactory? What would be more satisfactory is to have categories on both sides. And here is already clear which one, just a category of D modules. on Bungie. I will now write it like this because it's not a set anymore. So, you know, just for lack of better um, graphic skills, I'm just going to put it in a box. D modules on Bungie. What is this category? 
Again, this is something which Dima will tell us much more, so I just want to give an idea because it's essential to, to have a big picture of what this looks like to see the connection to physics, to gauge theory. That's why I have to talk about this. But he will tell us more. So here the idea is that we should just consider the moduli space of such gadgets. So we define another moduli stack, which is the moduli stack, which is called log of flat LG bundles. So again, I mean holomorphic or algebraic bundle. So this is holomorphic or algebraic, which is the same because the curve is compact or um, projective. And this is a holomorphic or algebraic connection on it. Algebraic connection on this bundle. So I used here whole to distinguish it from the connection um, in a C infinity sense, which had two parts, one of which the whole was actually, I must have, I, I should have said it is precisely the, the holomorphic part. But since now I'm not using this language anymore, I will just erase this whole and just talk about nabla as being a holomorphic algebraic connection, keeping in mind that what it was in this notation, it was H whole, the nabla whole. So these are objects. Over, just like bundles, it's a, it's a pairs, bundle and a, conne and a holomorphic connection or algebraic connection. And it turns out that there is actually a moduli stack of those. If we are over the complex case, there is a, there is a moduli stack you can define. And that is denoted log LG. So it is like bund G, except for bund G is just moduli of bundles only, without a connection. And now it's a moduli of bundles equipped with a holomorphic or algebraic connection. The notation log is because uh, such flat bundles sometimes called local systems or the RAM local systems. So uh, anyway, it's a notation. Uh, it's a particular notation. And the idea is that we should consider all modules on this. It's kind of easy to remember because see, D module, it is an example of a D module is a bundle with a flat connection. So now we consider so, sort of generalized bundles with flat connection on bundles on the module of bundles. But here we're considering just all modules, and all mod examples of all modules are just shifts of sections of bundles. So these are bundles defined on the moduli of flat bundles. So kind of the flatness switches from the base to the, to the shift. Easy, easy to remember. And the idea is that these two things should be equivalent if defined pro in the proper way. So they're certainly not equivalent in, in the naive sense. These two categories, but and as, at the very least, we have to consider derived categories. So we consider complexes of this, of these gadgets. And in the abelian case, which Dima talked about earlier, in the abelian case, when G is uh, maybe actually when G is GL one. This is actually then enough. This is a theorem which was proved independently by Jar Lamon and Mitch Rostin in the mid, I think in the mid 90s. In the abelian case. In the non abelian case, non abelian, this is not enough. Some modifications have to be made, either here or here or both, non abelian. So, Pellinson and Drenfeld saw this picture and they saw that there has to be such an equivalence, but they did not give a precise formulation. And only recently, um, D. Marinkin and Dennis Gaitskuri, with some contribution from Drenfeld, if I understand correctly, ha have come up with a precise formulation, which is a big achievement a precise formulation of what this equivalent should look like. And now even there are even proofs in some cases or outlines of proofs, we'll, we'll hear more from, from Dima. But this is very interesting because see now it's symmetrical kind of. So it's a category here and a category here and they're equivalent. And now we can, then you can ask, but what, what about this? This was already constructed in some cases. So how does it fit into the, in this new categorical language? Let's call this categorical language correspondence. 
categorical Langlands correspondence. And it actually fits very nicely because these are all modules. So these are, if you will, coherent sheets. So for instance, if the group is GL1, is GL if the group is GL1, you're talking about the Picard variety. Or uh, you can take, for example, just simplify, you can look at the, at the uh, degree zero part. In fact, well, you can, I'm, jump, I'm jumping a little bit, speaking a little too fast. GL1 is the moduli, uh, Picard variety, or Jacobian are the moduli spaces of line bundles, GL1 bundles, and degree zero line bundles, respectively. Here we have a bundle with a connection, so it's a bigger, it's a bigger object. But anyway, you can, uh, it's a nice algebraic variety. Again, if you kind of get rid, if you forget about the, the automorphisms of this. And you can see it's simply a coherent shift, so the right category of coherent shifts on it. So it's not so complicated, at first glance anyway. And for sure, there are some special objects. Name it skyscraper shifts. Supported at some point E. What is E? E is a pair, an LG bundle and a holomorphic connection. So it is a point of this, it's a point here. And so if you have a point here, you can look at the skyscraper shift. Now, this point may be a singular point, or this point could be a point which has uh, uh, certain symmetries, like orbifold point, for example. Uh, first, in the first approximation, let's exclude them. Let's look at the smooth, smooth points. Things will become more complicated for, for the other ones. So if there is indeed such an equivalence, it has to be an object on this side, which corresponds to it. Let's call it Fe. So this will be a D module. In general, it could be a complex of D modules because we're talking about derived categories. It will be a complex of D modules associated to this point E. And then it's very easy to show that this has to satisfy this Hecke property. If, from the beginning, you impose some additional structures on this, on this equivalence, namely, there are Hecke functors acting here, and Dima has explained what they are in the GL1 case for sure, and a little bit for GLN case. There are certain special functors which have to do with modifications of bundles acting here. There are also functors on this side which there is no standard terminology. So physicists call this Wilson functors. But I think it's better to call them Frobenius functors in honor, of, in honor of Frobenius. But they are much easier to define. It's not important now why, uh, what they are, especially because I'm running out of time. But the essential point is that these guys are going to be eigenshifts of these functors. Eigenshift means that if you apply such a functor, you will get back the same shift possibly multiplied, tensor multiplied, with a vector space. In the GL1 case, this vector space, if you, st if you consider the simplest Frobenius functors, well, that's still be one dimensional, so you will end up with the same shift, isomorphic to the same shift. So this is exactly what Dima was talking about. And in general, it's going to be multiplied by some vector space, maybe with some additional structure. So it is known that this is an eigenshift of these guys. But if so, this has to be an eigenshift of these guys. And that's why, that's, that's why Fe has to be a Hecke eigenshift. Must be. Must be a Hecke eigenshift. And so we recover this, except now it's not. Um, it's not um, anymore um, uh, puzzling why uh, for some element of some set we get an object of a category because they truly are not elements of a set. They are objects of a category. So, of course, the object is somehow assigned to a point of this guy. And at least if this point is smooth, then this object is uniquely defined up to an isomorphism. But it's much, much better now because it's these objects are corresponding to this. And now it sort of becomes clear what is really going on. It looks like a Fourier transform, really, because if you, have a Fourier, if you have a Fourier transform, you have two real lines, okay? You have a line with coordinate x, you have a line with coordinate t. You have seen the sum space of functions. It's not important now what these functions are. But you can think naively, in a kind of 
in the first approximation that there is a natural basis of these functions, namely delta functions supported at given points. So in some sense, every function is a direct integral of delta functions. Okay? So it is like the skyscraper sheave because it's also supported at a given point. But under the Fourier transform, as we know, it goes to e to the itx, right? So it is kind of a wave. Something which is defined, localized at a given point becomes a wave, just spread out over the whole thing. To make analogy even better, let's realize that this function is a solution of, the, of a differential equation in, in T, namely d dt minus ix psi equals zero. This is a solution of this equation. And every time you write a, a linear differential equation or a system of linear differential equations, you're defining a D module. This is just an example. This equation gives rise to an example of a D module. So in that sense, everything is very similar. You have something supported at a point, you get a wave. Which, so this is like a wave. You can think of this as the equation, or you can think of the space of solutions of this equation. It's, it's equivalent. Now, but now, what does, how does it help? It helps because we know that every function is, a direct, is, morally speaking, a direct integral of these guys. Just like every coherent sheaf, every O module, is a direct integral of skyscraper sheaves. Then, if there is such an equivalence, well, let's say here first for a moment. If there is such an isomorphism, Fourier transform, it means that every function can also be decomposed in a two direct integral of this. And this is a very powerful statement. Of course, we understand it from the point of view of group theory, harmonic analysis, and so on. But this is a nice way to think about it, because it's a non-trivial statement, but it comes in two steps. First, re realizing that this space is isomorphic to this space via Fourier transform. And in this space, there is an obvious basis of functions, just the delta functions. So you just apply this, and you get a nice basis. That's what Dima was talking about. He talked about trying to find a nice basis here. Well, that basis will come from a nice basis here of skyscraper sheaves. So just like every O module here morally is built from skyscraper shifts, we find out by means of this categorical equivalence that every object of the der derived category here can be built from this guy. So these guys are ex extremely important. And that becomes sort of the understanding, gives us a nice insight, a nice understanding of what the Langlands geometric categorical Langlands correspondence is really about. It's about finding a non-abelian Fourier transform in geometry which generalizes the abelian case where it's known as Fourier Mukai, Fourier Mukai transform. It really is a non-abelian Fourier Mukai transform. It's one way to think about it. Now, I have to stop, but in the next talk, I will discuss how this equivalence can be connected to something in that comes from S duality or electromagnetic duality in four dimensional super young Mills theory, following the work of Kapustin Witten and others. And this has been a big development in the last 10 years. Thank you very much.